Hey guys, welcome back. I hope everybody is well. Uh, today we're going to look at this topic since I just did a video on no law, no sin. Well, this video is going to be a natural progression after that. What to do without the law. What to do and how to live without the law. That's what this video is going to be about. And really, the real question is, when you ask how do you live without the law or what to do without the law, the real question is how to live in love. And who is love? Jesus Christ. So this video is really about how to live in the love of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only alternative you have when you let the law go. There's all this room for the love of Christ. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. What to do or how to live without the law. The answer is you're moving from living in the law to living in love, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the love of God, right? He is the grace of God. So you're moving away from the law to have more of Him and the Holy Spirit in your life. And likewise, as you move from out from under the law, you're going to move more into love. That will include letting go of some things. Over time, there will be no need to sin or to point out sin or to accuse people of sin, or to judge and condemn yourself for sin. There will be no more need for blaming people, or blaming yourself, or finding whose fault it is. See, that won't be in your life. There will be no need to accuse anyone of anything, and there will be no need for others to accuse you. If they do accuse you, you're going to use your boundaries, and you're going to speak the truth in love, and we're going to talk about all that. But there's no more need for accusing, for judging people, or yourself. There's no more need for condemning yourself or other people. There's no more need to meddle in other people's lives and trying to fix people and change people. Don't need to do that. There's no more need to try to control other people or manipulate them. That is all witchcraft. We don't need to do that. There's no more need to lie or to deceive yourself or other people. There's no more need to always say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry all the time, like you've done something wrong. There's no more need to be afraid of people because the Holy Spirit lives inside you and he has given you the power to deal with any and every situation that he allows into your life. All right, so let's go over some of these scriptures and each one correlates with one of the points here and I didn't have enough room to put these up big so I just made it real small. So the first thing you're going to do when you're learning to live in love, you're learning to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're learning to live under the shelter of the Most High God. You're learning to walk in the yoke. All of that is here, okay? One of the first things you're going to want to do is rejoice in the goodness of God. Psalm 9-2 says, I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. When you do this, you are acknowledging him every day, and you are being glad because he's God and you're not. You are delighted to be his child, and you are determined and surrendered so that his will can be done through you. Okay, the second one is thank him for all of his awesomeness. Now, this includes all of the other videos I've done, all the different points here but this is kind of just putting them all together and all the wonderful, great things he's done for us. We're going to thank him for those things. Um, 2 Corinthians 9.15 says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The grace of God is the best gift and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the best gift anyone could ever receive. And so we're going to be thanking him for his gift of righteousness, thanking him for his grace thanking him for his mercy, thanking him for protecting us, thanking him that we are even privileged to, to follow him and do his will, thanking him for everything that he provides for you, thanking him for guiding you and leading you and working all things together for your good. Over time, you're going to establish 
a spirit and a heart of thanksgiving. It's just going to be there the more you live in the spirit of Jesus Christ. There is a spirit of thanksgiving in him. The next point is we're going to learn to receive his love, receive his love, and learn to live in it. The more you receive it, the more there will be to live in. Okay, so you're going to want to always receive his love and his grace always for yourself and to give to other people. And you're going to receive it so much that it's going to bubble up and fill up your whole life. Colossians 2, 6 says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. Another thing you're going to learn to do in living in the Lord Jesus Christ, living in the land of love instead of the land of the law, is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. This talks about the armor of God being watchful, and you're basically watching for enemies, for, for the enemy to use somebody or some situation to cause you to be destabilized or fall or, you know, forget to put your breastplate of righteousness on and you get hit. So in all of that, you're learning to stand in the freedom that Christ has purchased for you and as you learn to stand in it and identify with it and take ownership or stewardship of it, you're going to eventually learn to defend it because you're going to identify with it. Why? Because you identify with Jesus Christ and that's the land that he's given you, the land of freedom. So eventually when you're standing in it, you're going to learn, yeah, this really is my territory. This is freedom and I'm going to stand here and I'm even going to prevent people from weaseling in and trying to steal my joy or put me back under the law or anything like that. The next point is we're going to learn to put everything in the context of God's grace to you. That is going to be the context of your entire life is the grace of God. You can just write that in cursive over your whole life yourself, your heart, all your weaknesses, your faults, your troubles, your relationships, your habits, your uh, family, your job, the community that you interact with, your hobbies. It's all going to be in that context. Why? Because you're no longer under the law. God has rescued you from being under the law and he's put you in himself and he is the grace of God. So when you put everything in the context of his grace, you're putting everything in the context of him and your relationship to him. Because your relationship is not based on sin anymore between you and the Lord. It is not based on sin. Why is it not based on sin? Because he's taken you out from under the law. He's lived the law perfectly for you, so you don't have to, not that you could. He's paid for all of your sins. He's raised you from the dead, cleansed you, forgiven you, and made you the new nature. Now, that's a lot, I know, but that's what the context of your relationship with him is, is grace. It's your, your relationship with him is by faith, and it's his grace that you're receiving. That is your relationship with him. It is not based on sin. I know a lot of people teach that, but it's not. It's out of context if you teach that for believers. So, in the next point, you're going to grow his presence in your life. Grow his presence in your life. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when you grow in his grace, you're going to be receiving his grace. And as you receive his grace, you're going to grow in the experiential knowledge of him as a person, as a being, the living, risen Christ, because you're going to be interacting with him and receiving things from him, and he's going to be healing you in that. You're going to be bonding with him. All kind of things are going to be happening, and that will grow his presence in your life when you receive his grace, see, because you're becoming one mind with him. He's the grace of God, and you're shifting everything in your life and in your heart to be in alignment with that grace, and that will definitely grow his presence in your life, and um, going to Matthew 11, uh, 28 and 29, 
in this presence over time, it will teach you, and, and walking in the yoke with him will teach you to rest. It will teach you. It trains you to rest when you walk in the yoke because he's the big, strong ox who's old and he knows everything. He knows where to go and what to do and where the bad guys are and everything. And you're just this little young ox and you don't know what's going on and you go over and, and he invites you to get into his yoke and you say okay and you put it on and you're just kind of observing and looking around and trying to learn and you're uh, feeling the way he walks his pace his path you're getting very familiar with him because you're beside him all the time and you're learning to walk as he walks because you're in the yoke with him okay so that is going to teach you to rest because it teaches you that he's God you're not that he does the work. You don't do the work. You're just hanging out with him. You may do some things, but it's not going to be stressful or hard or pressing or you don't need to freak out about anything. He takes care of everything. He's God and you're not. And that is, that's really the fear of the Lord. If you could sum it up, is knowing that he is God and you are not. See, and that will teach you to rest. It will teach you to move into a rest that is an emotional and spiritual rest. And it is wonderful. And I just can't tell you how wonderful it is. So really put a star by this one. The next one is enjoy the royal blood that the Lord has given to you. And you know that in your airship, with Christ, that he has given you his royal blood. You're in the royal bloodline of Jesus Christ now because he's adopted you into his family. You have royal blood now. I hope you know that now. It's really true. Romans 8, 17 says, Now if we are children of God, which we are, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So God is up here where heirs to him because we're his children and Jesus Christ is our big brother. So it'd be the Lord, uh, G the God Almighty, and then the Lord Jesus Christ is his son. And then we are equal with the Lord Jesus Christ in the airship that he has. We are equal with him. He's our big brother and we're his little brothers and sisters. So you need to start getting used to the fact that if you're a believer, you now have royal blood, the, the same bloodline as the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. That is your bloodline now, okay? It's a big deal. Okay, so now we're going to look over here, and we're, again, we're looking at what to do without the law in our lives. What do we do, and how do we live without the law? Well, what we're really asking when we ask that question is how to live in love how to live in the Lord Jesus Christ, how to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, none of the things that I'm teaching you are black and white. It's all a process. And so you'll get that the more you grow. This is a real important point, and it um, relates to this standing and defending your freedom. But in a more practical sense, over here, you're going to learn to stay in your hula hoop. I've done a series of... Uh, videos on my playlist on my channel there's a playlist tab and if you look there there is a eight class series of boundaries teachings and we talk about your boundary being your hula hoop that you put around you and so that's why I'm saying stay in your hula hoop because Galatians 6 7 in the New Living Translation said says don't be misled or deceived you cannot mock the justice of God you will always harvest what you plant. So my question for you is what kind of seeds are you planting in your life? What kind of seeds are you planting in your own thoughts every day about yourself, about your family, about your job? What, are, what words are coming out of your mouth every day? What actions are you taking every day? Are you planting good seeds? Are you planting seeds that will grow to be a blessing to you and those around you? Well, you can ask the Lord, if you're not, to teach you how. Because he is the master farmer and the master gardener, and he can do that for you. So you're going to want to keep your hula hoop on, and you're going to want to learn to stand in that hula hoop and say to yourself the truth that God Almighty has given me this territory to live in, and this is my sacred space, 
and I'm the policeman, if you will, or the sheriff of this area, and I can allow in the nice people who love me and bless me and help me and strengthen me and build me up. And then if there's some mean people or some bullies or some manipulators out there, I'm going to keep them um, at a distance because they're going to try to bring me down. That's just a real simplified view of it, but that's what you're going to learn to do. And as you do that, you're going to learn that you're going to do more and more of the will of God and that the toxic people will just fall by the wayside in your life. If they're using you or abusing you and you put up a boundary, guess what? They're going to go find someone else to use or abuse. So you don't have to have them in your life. People that drain the life out of you. The next point is to guard and pour out your heart. You're going to want to guard your heart. And I've talked about in other videos, um, keeping your heart in the rib cage that God has put it in. Try to let it, the more you learn to rest, the more your heart is going to be settled in your soul. It's not going to be leaping out. Oh, I want that. Oh, I need this. Looking for something because that something is living inside you. And you're going to move from, I need this, I need that, to I have everything I need. And it's all right here inside me. See, that's the Holy Spirit that provides everything for you and gives you peace and heals you. So you're going to guard your heart. And that, that, that really, you're really protecting your heart is basically what that means. You're protecting it from being seduced. You're protect, protecting it from being uh, wounded. You're protecting it from being uh, whatever your tendency would be. You're protecting it from that happening again. And as you guard your heart, you're going to learn more and more to pour it out. You're not designed by God, just like your brain and your mind are not designed to manage all the information in the world. That's not something that one human being can do. Just the same, your heart was not designed to be so burdened and so filled up with trauma that you can't function. See, that tells you that your heart's not meant to do that. And in fact... Humans are not even meant and wired and equipped to deal with sin or abandonment or rejection and all the things we have to face here. We're not designed to deal with those things. So that's why we need the Holy Spirit. So anyway, you're going to want to guard and protect your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else, above your money, your marriage, your children, your Wall Street investments. Guard your heart is the most important thing. Because that's where the Lord lives. That's where all the issues of life flow from you. That's where you get your motivation to do things. That's where your desires come from is the heart. And so you're going to want to pour it out. The pain, the trouble, the frustration, the trauma, the sorrow. This world is filled with sorrows. And if you live more than five minutes in this world, you're going to realize that. The grieving you have to do over, over things that you really feel like you want it and you know you're not going to get that or things that you have in your life that you don't want that you can't get rid of or you can't change and so that serenity prayer would come in uh, with this one God grant me the serenity to change the things I can and to accept the things that I can't change and to wisdom to know the difference um, here the next point is to resist black and white thinking and so I did a video on black and white thinking, if that would help you. And so in order to resist the black and white thinking, you're going to have to recognize it and spot it and recognize it in yourself. So ask the Holy Spirit to make you aware of black and white thinking and to help you to be discerning so that you can find it and resist it. Say, no, nope, I'm not under the law anymore. Because black and white thinking, just like receiving a spirit of guilt, will take you right back under the law. And you're going to wonder, wait, what happened? I've stopped growing. I'm so miserable. I'm so depressed. What happened? Well, you probably got hooked back under the law. And the more times you do that, you're going to learn each time the enemy uses something to get you back under the law. You're going to say, that's not going to happen again. You go back, well, that's not going to happen again. And soon there won't be anything left for him to pull you back in. And you'll have victory over him in that area. Um, and then we have the next point is to remember the truth. Remember what God says about you. Remember the truth of God's words and what he says about you. And 
take all the places in you that don't agree with him and pour those out and take in his words about you as your true identity. And Ephesians 4.23 basically says that we're to renew our minds. Renew our minds. Why do we renew them? Because they were new at salvation. Our minds were brand new at salvation. We were given the mind of Christ. And that's why we have to renew it. That means do it again, over again, over and over again, because our minds, when we're in this dimension and we have all these things that have happened to us, we can get mixed up and we can get into a bad place. But when we keep renewing our minds, we'll stay in a better place. The next point is to receive grace and truth. In John 1, 14, the scripture says that Jesus Christ was full of grace, number one, and truth, number two. So we are going to want, since we are in Christ and we are living in him and learning to follow him and internalize him, we're going to receive his essence. His essence is grace and truth. So we're going to learn to receive grace and truth from him. Receive grace and truth all day. (gasps) Breathe it in. Just take it in. Drink it in. Eat it in. However you want to see it. And then the more you fill up on grace and truth, the more you're going to be able to give that to other people. See? And the more grace you receive from the Lord, the more your heart's going to be healed. The more grace you receive from the Lord, the more you're going to be able to say no to sin because Titus tells us that's what the grace of God teaches us to do over time. So you're going to receive grace and truth. That is the essence of Christ. And you're going to give it over time. The more you receive, the more you'll be able to give. And in this receiving and giving grace and truth, you're going to learn to speak the truth in love. That's part and parcel of grace and truth because the love is like the grace and the truth is the truth. So it's very similar and that's Ephesians 4.15 talks about speaking the truth in love. First you have to learn to speak if you've never spoken up for yourself before and then you're going to have to try real hard to just let the truth out. It may take a long time and then you're going to learn to do it in spirit of grace and gentleness. Okay, and so the next point is to listen and follow. This, um, growing his presence in your life and putting everything in the context of grace and receiving his love and all of these will really, really help you to basically walk in a yoke more with him because you're going to be listening and following. Why are you going to be listening? Because you're not God. He's God. You're not. That's why you listen And he can speak to you. You can speak to him and pour out your heart, but you're not dictating to him and telling him how to run the universe. You don't need to because he's God. That's why you're listening to him. If anyone ever wants to know what I'm doing at any given moment, that's probably 90% of the time I'm listening. Lord, what's next? What are we doing? Got an idea for this? What are we doing here? You know, I'm listening. That's my whole life is listening to hear the prompting of the Lord. Uh, That is my joy and my delight. So you will listen, and then what he tells you, you're going to follow along. If you can't do it, you can say, I can't do this. Help me. Heal my heart. I'm afraid. Whatever the issue is that comes up, and he will stop and help you so that you can eventually follow along. I did a video, a very short video, less than two minutes. It's called Take My Yoke. On my channel it's like a little cartoon but it encapsulates this whole thing and so Matthew 11 28 through 30 Jesus Christ says come to me come to me not the Bible not church not given to the poor not confessing our sins not saying a Hail Mary come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden from rituals that provide no peace that means the law and Galatianism and all that. He's calling us from that to himself. And I will give you rest. He's promising this rest over here when you walk in his yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. What are you going to learn in the yoke? That Jesus Christ is gentle, very gentle, and he's very humble. And you will find rest for your souls. Why? Because his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. It's not heavy. 
it's very light. All right, the next point is that you're going to develop your gifts. If you don't know what your gifts are, go take a spiritual gifts test and then pray for opportunities in God's time and in his way to use those gifts, okay? 1 Peter 4.10 tells us to use our gifts for the benefit of the body. That's the point, is, is for God's glory and for the blessing of the body. As we each use our gifts, we're blessing one another. See, it all goes all the way around. And that is the beauty of the body of Christ. That blood is just flowing around to all the parts of the body. We're encouraging each other. We're strengthening each other. We can correct each other. We can... Um, you know, encourage everything, all of that, all the time. Okay, the next point is to stay connected. Firstly, you're going to stay connected to the Lord. You really can't help it because He lives inside you, right? So you can't run away from Him. If you ran to any other country in the world and hid under a hundred blankets under the ground, He's right there with you. So you can't not be connected to the Lord. You're always connected to Him, but your goal is going to want to be to have some type of experiential reality of your connection with him in this life. Some people need to go and be in nature. Some people like to just have quiet and read the Psalms. Some people have uh, different types of music they listen to. Whatever works for you, do that regularly to feel in your heart that you are connected so that you can enjoy that connection like God has with you. And then, of course, because we are the body of Christ, staying connected to the body of Christ is just as important as staying connected to Him. Okay? Those are very important. So you're going to want to be drawn to the people in the body of Christ who are authentic. People who you can tell them anything and they'll just say yes and they'll listen to you and they'll support you. And if you need help, they'll help you to get help. You know, it's not someone who's going to make you feel uncomfortable or judge you or, you know, bonk you over the head with a Bible verse or anything like that. Authentic, loving people is who you want to gravitate toward in the body of Christ. They have Stephen's ministers that can serve you in that way. There are groups called Grief Share if you're going through a hard time. Someone has died. There's Living Waters, Cross Current, all of my classes if you're in the Atlanta area. So, and then lastly, I want you to be very, very clear in your understanding that reaching out for help is a wonderful thing. It's a good thing. It's a healing thing. It's a brave thing. It is something that you can be proud of. If you need help, there is no shame, embarrassment, or anything like that. That is normal in this world for a human to need help with the fragmentation and the evil everywhere and all the things we've been through in our childhood. Oh my goodness. So when you reach out, if you have to reach out, do it confidently. Know that that is God's will for you. It's only your pride and fear and shame that will keep you from reaching out. And James 5.16 is kind of a good model or something like that for healing and help. You can always go to a group or go see a counselor or go to an AA meeting, whatever your issue is. If you really need help and you're not progressing, um, or it's getting worse, or you feel like you really have a stronghold there, find people to pray for you. Hook, hook up with people and connect with people that are in the same kind of situation that you are. Okay? That will be very helpful. Now, so overall, we're just looking here at what we're going to do without the law. If you have been focused on the law, thinking about the law, living under the law, stressing out under the law for a long time, you will have lived your life in fear, shame, condemnation, uh, all kinds of terrible things, judgment. And so it's going to take time for you to move into this area. And so don't condemn yourself or shame yourself for anything. It takes time to move from law into grace. And it's very common for you to swing back and forth to where you can kind of equalize in the middle and get comfortable here. All right, so this is really, as you're coming out of the law, what are we going to do? Well, we're learning to live in the love of God. 
the love and the grace of Christ, okay? Because he is the love of God and he is the grace of God. All right, so I hope something I've said has been helpful. And I pray that you would press into the Lord and get to know him better and receive his grace and let him show you around in this land of freedom and this land of love that he's purchased for you because he's done it. He's paid for it at a very high price and you're worth that price. And that's why he did it. All right. I'll talk to you later.